Yeah, Critters Live! Thank you for having your camera on, Michelle and Mr. Victor. And as always, I am your host, Brian. Today, we're going to be talking about um, a little more business aspect of things, finding your niche. Uh, before we get into it, I want to talk about uh, some wins. Wins. So my win, uh, I had a really nice time at our local Renaissance Fair this last weekend. So that's the win I'm going to share with you guys. Um, kid free and just did my whole pirate thing. Um, let's hear from Mr. Ron. Mr. Ron, you got a win to share with us today? Hey, Brian, can you hear me? Sure can. Hey, good to see you again. Yeah, good to be back. <laughs> Yeah, um, my win was um, we we shut down for the week this past week. I uh, got away, went out of town. Uh, we hung out in Philadelphia with friends, and uh, it was good to just reconnect and just just breathe. Yeah, yeah. I saw I saw some pictures on Facebook. Yes, um, it's it looking nice. It was uh, it was very good. We took in a Phillies game on Thursday. And then uh, the rest of the weekend, um, we were attending a retreat uh, with some friends, uh, very dear friends of ours, lost their son. And uh, so we were helping them to cope and get through things. And it was a very good weekend. Well, good to hear. Sorry for their loss. If you uh, can extend that to them, if you talk to them again soon. Uh, well, I think that applies to all of us here. Um, but thank you for sharing. I'm glad you had overall a good weekend. We got a bunch of other people in the attendees list. So get on in here, get those cameras on. Let's do that face to face. I'm always talking about it. You guys know the drill. No, nothing, nothing new with this one. We want those cameras. We want, I want, I want that face to face. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. I see you there. I've been watching some of your YouTube videos, Ryan. You have a win to share with us this week. Um, can you hear me? Sure can. When is, um, let's see, just printing DTFs. That's pretty much it. <laughs> not, not too crazy, but DTF has definitely um, been keeping me busy. So I guess that's a win, right? Yep, yep, yep. And those YouTube videos are looking good. Looking trying, good. I'm trying. <laughs> right on. Michelle, you were one of the first people in here today. Let's hear a win from you. I'd have to start out by saying that your last week's live, mm -hmm. that special thing that you did with the cotton to clean the bar. Ah, yes. Oh, that works like a charm. <laughs> Good. And then um, you also said to clean the print head, you know, that black part that's the to the right of it. Yeah. So I've been doing that every time after I print and what a difference. Oh, good. I loved it. Thank you. Awesome. Good. I'm glad I'm glad that made a, an impact. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that. Thank you for reporting back. That that made my day. That's that's going to be my my added win for today is that uh, last week's content made a difference for you. Good. Good. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. And it's up on YouTube already, according to our team here. So uh, if those of you who missed last week, uh, our maintenance content from last week is already up on YouTube. So you guys can check that out after this. Uh, and we got Michael and Yvonne. What's up, guys? Uh, you guys got a win to share with us, being the uh, you and Victor are the last ones that need to share some wins. We have been doing some fulfillment for mm -hmm. two of our largest clients, and we're really excited about it. We have mailed off the first three orders from the one web they uploaded their website um and then we just continue to replenish the other um from that fulfillment yeah that that constant flow is uh is the way to the way to do it uh so for those of you and thank you so much for for joining and for sharing uh so for those of you who joined a little bit late our topic for today is going over uh, your niche, your niche market, cutting out that little swath of the market just for you and, and serving that, uh, that customer base. We've touched on it um, kind of in passing 
in previous creators' lives, and, and the, the team and I thought it would be uh, very valuable uh, for the whole group um, if we kind of explored a little more explicitly uh, what the thought process is, maybe for those of you uh, who are, are watching this who are just starting out, um, and what, what, what goes into determining what market you're serving specifically. Um, considering a lot of you guys uh, who are my regulars, Ron and Victor, Michael, uh, Michelle, Ryan, you guys all serve a specific niche. And so I wanted to explore that for maybe those folks here who are newer to the group and might be newer to the business. Um, and as always, we do have Emily here in the chat. So say hi to Emily. She, she handles your guys' orders when you put it in. Uh, so she's super cool. There she is. Hi, Emily. Face to the name. Every time I see one of our, one of our people in here, we got to shout them out. So I want to kind of talk to you guys about, does, does anyone have anything just to start out and share? about how they got started into the business and into and how you settled into your specific niche and what niche that might be. Michael and Yvonne, I see you raising your hand. Let's start with you guys. Michael's always wanted to do t-shirts mm -hmm. and he and I just happened to the day before be talking about what it would take because I was still working mm -hmm. um, and we were talking about what it would take to actually get started. And I was at work and he was looking through marketplace and he called me and he said, you're not going to believe this. And I always thought to myself and said out loud to him, how much is it going to cost? And he came across this little thing in marketplace that was like a miniature shop startup hmm. so we bought it and make t-shirts they said it'll be fun they said and so we bought it and we were just going to make t-shirts for our friends and we belong to um the booster club here it's a triple a team here in south carolina and mm -hmm. so we started making t-shirts to help the boosters. You know, we'd sell t-shirts and stuff like that. Well, then one day a girl that watches my dogs for me came over to the house and she had a different shirt on. And I said to her, I haven't seen you at the vet anymore. What's going on? She said, well, I'm working for my cousin now. And I said, well, you know, if, he ever needs t-shirts for anything. That's kind of what we do on the side. And yeah, so a week later, we had a 3,000 piece order. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that'll jumpstart you. Yeah, so from there, you know, we were working a little bit for a friend of ours and they told somebody they knew and then they told somebody they knew and that's how our start got going. Wow, okay. Um, I have a question for Michael specifically. Out of all the crafty side businesses, why t-shirts? Uh, I started with a vinyl cutter. Okay. And I was just making little window stickers for one of our four-wheel drive clubs. And then I found out that you could buy this HTV to put on T-shirts. So it just grew from there. Okay, okay. So it didn't start with, oh, I want to make T-shirts. It's, oh, I'm doing this other thing and I can also make T-shirts. Yes. And then the T-shirts took over. Yes. Okay, I see. And so what kind of niche would you say that you serve uh, uh, primarily? We, we do wholesale. Wholesale, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and I think there's a lot of business to be had there. As you guys yeah. have just a steady stream of orders, I think that speaks volumes, considering you guys also 
uh, have only recently started doing the online aspect of things. So just off of word of mouth, it's kept you busy. Yes. We're doing online for somebody else, not for us. Well, we, we got to get you there too. Our, us part up yet. Right on. Well, thank you guys for, uh, you know, sharing the, the origin story, if you will. Um, I want to I wanna get some of the other people in the group um, and how they got started. Uh, Victor, I know you've shared your, uh, your kind of origin story with the group a number of times. So, so we might circle back to you unless you are particularly excited to share. <laughs> I'm always open to hearing other people's stories. You've heard mine plenty, but uh, okay. if you have any questions, let me know. Okay, okay, we'll circle back to you. We'll we'll pick on you last. Um, I I want to hear Michelle. Michelle, you're you're one of the newer regulars that we've got coming around, uh, at least on camera, and I want to kind of get to know you and and let the group get to know where you're starting from and why. Why t-shirts is maybe the first question. I'm kind of like in the same boat that Michael was in. Mm -hmm. I started with a vinyl cutter and am a coach at the middle school for our cross country team. Uh -huh. So they wanted me to do shirts. It's like, oh, okay, I'll do shirts. Well, my first order was a hundred shirts with five different colors. And it was like, okay, I'm done with this. I'm going to go straight to a direct to garment <laughs> printer. This is nuts. <laughs> and um, so that was about five years ago, six years ago. And um, ever since it kind of like got my foot in the door with the school system. So, okay. I'm, so I, I'm kind of, my niche is more towards the schools, the sports, mm -hmm. and wholesale. Okay, nice. So that sounds a lot like um, like Victor here. He, he serves a lot of the school niche as well, as far as I'm aware. I'm sure he does other things as well, and we'll, we'll get to him. We'll, we'll save him for last. But uh, yeah, so that seems like it's a, a pretty popular avenue. Uh, yeah. But you started, you know, already in the school realm and then added the shirts where some yeah. folks start with the shirts and then explore into the school realm. So that's really neat to, to learn about. And what, and then, um, what equipment did you start with? It was... The free Jet. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so, so straight into the Free Jet, right on. Yes, I did my research and I found that um, it was actually my five-year plan was to go to the Free Jet. And um, my husband, he... He kind of saw what I went through and he says, no, we're going to do this now. So it kind of happened a lot quicker. And uh, and at the time, this is like my side hustle. Mm -hmm. And so like everybody here knows there's a learning curve and um, learning the pre-treat. I mean, it. I spent I spent thousands of dollars because I'm a perfectionist. So I'll admit that right now. And I mean, I had to get things done. My number, um, my number one client was 100% polyester shirt. So I had to get that done. And I mean, just. I, I feel guess, that. You know, just practiced. Mm -hmm. Yep. No, I, oh man, with the polyester too and having to get it perfect. Oh, I feel that. Yeah. yeah. Nowadays, folks are a little spoiled with uh, direct-to-film to kind of serve that need. Um, yeah, I'm still more on the direct-to-garment side. I'm not to the film side yet. It just feels too funny for me. Mm, a, little, a little too stiff? Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. fair. Yeah. Uh, man, yeah, I'll, I'll kind of segue off of that with a story of my own. Uh, when I was working here back when we launched the, the 330 TX Plus, uh, I was one of the three people in charge of developing the user manual and the process for doing the polyester. And at that time, every single bottle of pretreatment that I would get from R&D behaved differently. And they weren't telling me that anything was changing uh, and this was pre-release and they weren't telling me that anything was changing with the formula. So I was just pulling my hair out 
doing the exact same thing and getting different results, it was driving me nuts. But eventually they got the formula settled and it was pretty easy from there. It's just, you know, more pre-treat, more time on the heat press and, and it kind of worked itself out. But uh, yeah, oh man, that, that, that brings me back. <laughs> <laughs> that brings me back. Oh, well, thank you for sharing, Michelle. Let's, uh, let's hear from someone else in the group about their origins. I want to hear, um, well, it looks like maybe Matthew's not around. I'm just seeing the ceiling there. So we'll, we'll give him a pass for now. Uh, maybe let's hear from Ryan. Uh, I, I see you're doing stuff, Ryan. So if, you, if you're busy, I'll give you a pass for now too, and maybe get you later. But, uh, You've, you've got multiple machines of ours, so I, I and you're doing the YouTube scene. So I especially wanted to hear from you about where you started and what kind of niche that you're serving. Okay, just want to make sure you guys can hear me, right? Yes. Um, I started, actually, I worked uh, for a basketball clothing line or clothing company. Mm -hmm. And they were doing a lot of like AAU uniforms for the kids. And there was, we every now and then we'll do like t-shirts and things like that. So I'll say, hey, it's pretty simple. I mean, I didn't, I was in the, the production. I wasn't in the production end, but mm -hmm. so I decided, you know, I'm a DJ, if you guys don't know, but um, I wanted to do something for that market, you know, for my fellow DJs. And then um, I bought a press, screen printing press, smaller than the one I got back here. And just out of nowhere, a lot of people just found out I was doing it. And the, my clothing brand got pushed behind and now I'm, printing everybody else's stuff um so that's the how basically i got started but as far as the niche um i do a lot of like hotels um just because djing at weddings and big venues i'm always dj i'm also handing off my other card you know what i mean my other my other business and i just got a good rapport with a couple of uh, management and management they kind of talk and move around different hotels so that I, they kind of bring me with them to oh, different awesome. hotels so that's just how my niche is like i would say about 60 70 percent hotels and the wow. rest of it is, it's all private stuff okay nice so hotels started out with the dj uh supplementing the dj scene um yeah. wow okay it's crazy because like you, you, people don't like you don't know what what people are are needing mm -hmm. so it's like the worst thing that people could say is no right mm -hmm. but once you give them that card or once you give them that information um they believe it or not they 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 refer revert back to it you know like oh i remember this guy you know because at that time they probably don't need shirts or they probably don't need hats or whatever or whatnot but um when the time comes they'll remember it and that's just how i got into printing basically it's just because people remember oh i remember for my for my sake is like i remember that guy was djing this whatever's wedding and he gave me mm -hmm. this card and usually they'll have it if they don't have it they'll find out who the dj was and they'll call me so it's just kind of like that's how i that's just how i got started that works out pretty nicely yeah yeah <laughs> sweet and since uh since you're doing the youtube side of things as well uh where does that come into play? What, what made you decide you're going to add YouTube on top of, you know, the existing couple of businesses? Uh, well, YouTube wasn't, it wasn't a thing that I wanted to, to do because I used to write. And so my wife said, um, you know, why won't you write, you know, just like a journal or whatever. I said, I don't want to write. So I said, you know what, let me do YouTube. So, you know, make it like a, a daily journal video wise right okay so if if something does ever happen to me i you know if i'm done with this world and i'm done i'm over with i'm on the ground or whatever my kids can still re revert back to that video you know they can still quote unquote see me that's just how i i saw it but then i kind of incorporate what i was doing in my daily life and the youtube kind of like turned into from a diary to like screen printing and other stuff <laughs> But again, it's still the purpose of like, when I'm long gone, they can still quote, quote, see me in the, in, in the video. Oh, that's very sweet. Yeah. I like the sentiment there. 
Yeah. Yvonne's got a question, it looks like. Hey, yeah, Ken. Hey, how are you? I'm good. What's up? Um, so I'm always interested in watching new people. And so if you could drop your YouTube channel, that would be awesome. And uh, I congratulate you on getting into the hotel business because a lot of places would rather something big like that. Often they only use corporations and stuff. So getting in there and getting your foot in the door, that's awesome. Yeah, and that's the thing, right? At once, you know, it, it's funny people say that. It's like once your foot is like even barely in the door, you're in the door. You know, it's just more of like um, uh, I, I think I did a lot of calling back. Say, hey, you know, I, I'm, in, I'm in town today. Anybody I could talk to, you know, because once they, they hear your voice, they hear your name, um, you know, like I said, they might not need you now. But you never know, like Earth Day came up, they needed shirts, you know, or like housekeeping day or whatever it is came up, they needed shirts. So it's, it's one of those things. And and it, it's just uh, there's always something going on in hotels, especially where they, where they have like, you know, 200, 300 people employed. Something's got to come up every month. So and that's that's just the case of it. So I wanna I wanted to also ask the group, and I think this might be uh, valuable for the new folks in here. Um, where do you see the T-shirt decoration space heading in the next couple of years? So from from direct to garment, then direct to film became huge. In in like a three month period, everybody wanted direct to film uh, once it came out. Uh, what do you guys see the trend leading towards uh, for the next uh, section of the year? Does anybody have a, a source where they get a pulse on, uh, on these things? Um, for my business, I, am, um, I still do a lot of the shirts. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of sublimation. Uh, for me, it's... it's uh, it's customization. So it's not just printing the team logo on the shirt. It's putting, and I do a lot of sports stuff. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, I got, I'm, I do a lot of stuff for clubs. And though the players already have their practice shirts, they have their jerseys, they have, uh, they have the, 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 that stuff, you know, that it's, that's not really the, what I'm trying to sell because they'll they'll go with like a soccer company to make their jersey right, and that's not really my business. I, uh, and so, so I'm trying to get to the 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 fan right. Like, believe it or not, these ten and twelve year old kids that play soccer, they have fans. They have the grandma and the grandpa and their dad and their mom and siblings. So it's it's not just selling a shirt that says San Diego Hawks or Surf. It's a shirt that says surf on the front and it has their number, the, their player's number on the back with their name going down. And then now it's personalized. And what that's done for me is instead of selling a $25 t-shirt with the front, it's now turned into a $35, $40 t-shirt because now I just printed the name in the back. And it's, and that's not really, uh, it, you know, the doing a name doesn't take up a lot more ink and actually it fits in the sheet. I just have sheets that have the templates with, with blank number, black name. And then I just change all those and print those. And, and so then the sheet comes out with the front and back on it. So that, that helps me upsell. And then it's not just doing that with, with a lot of stuff that we do now, which is embroidered and sublimation. We do water bottles, right? So we're doing like the team water bottles and we're doing embroidery and now I'm doing embroidery with a team logo on the front. And then we're going to do the player number embroidered on the side on the left, which again, that's an extra $15 charge that you're adding to the hat. So when they were paying $27 for it and they're adding 15, my math is what 42. So, so it's, uh, that's, that's a much higher price point and that's what you're trying to get at. So how do you, how do you do that? And, and, and I think what makes me different and, and, and the niche that it really helps me uh, attain is that 
like the soccer club, they could have gone with soccer.com and done, uh, you know, had a whole line of product and this and that, but they're so big and they're not as flexible and to do all that customization, they really don't want to, they just want to sell team jerseys and that's it. So this whole like product need that these teams have, they're not getting because these bigger guys don't want to adjust to that. And so because you're nimble, you can do that. Like this is a water bottle that we did for a basketball girls basketball club and it has number 35 and it has the girl the the this one doesn't have the name on it but we can do it so um and it doesn't take much that much longer to do right if, especially if you have like your systems in place so mm -hmm. for me that's the the trend the other trend is i'm starting to buy pre-made um not that i'm inventing it i mean it's always been around but i'm starting to buy pre-made transfers so we're taking a lot of these clubs and we're creating like glitter type of prints with the club name and stuff like that. And the moms love it. Hmm. And so, uh, so, you know, surf. And so I did have one that says surf. And then instead of having a surf mom, I bought a bunch of moms separately. So then when I, when they want the mom, I just put them together on the heat, pla on the heat plan and, and press them. So I have less moms and a lot more surfs. Right. And then so uh, so that kind of stuff. So customizing it so that it's for them is yes, it's more work, but I think the 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 average order value will go up significantly once you add your fifteen and twenty dollar pops for each one of those customizations. Yeah, right on. And I think you uh, you mentioned something that was really cool to me. Um, you're just pre-printing the numbers the keywords and then doing the print on demand for the the specifics and i think that's um something that maybe michelle can integrate if she's not already doing where um just pre-print some of that uh stuff that you know everybody's going to want to put onto that shirt that's that's a really nice uh tip i like that yeah um, okay, so si since I've got you on the hot seat, Victor, uh, I'll mm -hmm. ask you the next little uh, uh, section here is, uh, what do you think is maybe the most important skill or quality that someone needs to be successful in this industry? That's a hard question because we're all small, right? So we all have to wear all these different hats. So we have to have a lot of different skills. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh and that's the hardest part. Like, like I could tell you like, oh, it'd be a good salesperson. But then you also kind of have to kind of be a little bit of a techie person and you got to be a real patient person and you got to be, and I'm not talking patient with the customers. I'm just talking about patience with the hardware, <laughs> you know? And so uh, uh, you got to have some design sense. You have to have some fashion sense. It's, it's really hard uh, to answer that question because unless you can hire specific people to focus in those areas, uh, you kind of have to do it all. So um one thing i tell people who are who start off as artists and they want to sell t-shirts mm -hmm. the one quality that i find in a lot of artists is that they put a lot of effort into their art and they get really married to their work and if a customer says oh i want to change this they get heartbroken right and like that's it's the art's not for you it's for them right at the end of the day you know you can make whatever you want for you but just you know if you're getting a someone to give you a couple of dollars for it and hopefully more that's really the end goal so you got to be flexible you got to listen to what they say you got to be patient and you got to know when to go in and make decisions for customers too because sometimes a, a customer can non decide you to death and so you could you could say like oh yeah you know what I think these black jackets would be better. My other client uses these jackets and they do really well, whether it's true or not, it's a little flip, fib, but that's just enough to push them over the edge and be like, okay, I'm going to do that. And when they say that, 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 then you can run, right? Like you can run, no one's stopping you. You got everything you need. So uh, just knowing when to, when to be patient, knowing when to push and, uh, you know, and, and leverage the people, you know. Uh, you know, I, I, I do a lot of art myself, but I have a guy who does art that he's much better than I am. And so I leverage him and he leverages me for other things. So don't be afraid to barter some of the things to do your inside work, because that at the end of the day can can help you out, too. It's, it's a lot of hats. That's the problem. You got to be prepared to wear them all. And sometimes at the same time. A lot of versatility in the business, huh? It, you know, when you're small, yes. 
Yeah. I mean, I have so many ideas that I could do. I just don't have enough hours in the day, right? I only got mm. 24 of them and I got to sleep a few. So um, when you get to the point where you can let go of a task and you can cover that person, let go of the task, let them do it, you know, oversee, but don't be, uh, what do you call it? When they, uh, when they micromanage. Uh, micromanage, don't micromanage too much because you will micromanage yourself to death and then everything else will, will, uh, will fall by the wayside. So it's hard. It's a balance. I don't know if I answered your question, but I think my, how scattered my, my answer was, that's how scattered my job description is. So you have to be good at all of that. Right on. No, I think that answer is very well. Um, you know, just having to be prepared to do everything yourself, uh, especially while you're starting out. Um, but I also like the tip that you add uh, to be prepared to let go of a certain task when the time is right. Um, so that that's, I think that's some really nice advice. So one thing I would say is like, if you set the expectation with the customer, mm -hmm. then it gives you some room to do a, wear a lot of those hats. So um, I know some people they're like, Oh, well, they placed an order. I got to get it to them in three days. Like, no, tell them it'll be two weeks. They'll understand if you tell them it'll be two weeks and you get it to them in two weeks, then you're a reliable guy, right? You're a reliable person and they'll do business again with you. Like my boys, my boys in college, he wants to work, but he can only work three days a week. So I leverage him to run all the machines and do all the printing, but he can only do it three days a week. So I can't promise that product in two days because he's only working three days a week. So I tell them two weeks and everybody's happy and no problems, right? Hopefully. Yeah, but setting the right expectations is the key. Um, you want to uh, under promise over deliver, if anything. So Correct. awesome. Uh, anybody else have anything to add to that? Anything to uh, impart to someone who's just starting out in the industry? Victor answered it with, with such uh, scope and efficiency and detail that he just nailed it right out of the park, sounds like. Well, I think you did. I think you did an awesome job because my thought was you have to be flexible but there comes a time where you have to tell the customer, okay, here's the deal, here's your options, what do you want? Because at some point, you gotta say no. You gotta say no, or you gotta make the decision for them, one of the two. Gotta set that line in the sand. And yeah, I've heard a lot of horror stories of folks getting kind of run over by uh, deadlines that they had to accept in order to take the job and uh, kind of drowning in those expectations uh, as they move forward and scale up. So I think, uh, I think I agree with that, though I can't speak from experience. That's why I'm mainly letting you guys talk about this one, because you guys have all the experience here. I'm customer service for 35 years, so it comes natural to me after an, a career of it, but you sometimes have to know how to actually just steer people, you know, mm -hmm. and that's all you can do. At the end of the day, as long as you feel like you've done the best job you can do, then you've been successful. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So I think we're at the end. Uh, is there any other questions that anybody had for anybody who's spoken or for myself before we close it out? Ryan, got your hand up. So polite. Take it away. You're muted. Sir. Uh, I'm used to these meetings. I have to put my hand up. Um, I do have a question. Um, I'm fairly new to direct to film and uh, just the process of it. But as far as I'm still trying to wrap my head on pricing. So if there's anybody here that can help me and try to figure out my pricing. And I, again, I'm in California, so we're a little bit on the higher end as far as pricing goes. But, um, you know, you, you guys got any tips? Because the last thing I want is to drive the market down as far as um, pricing goes or even drive it up because of the pricing. So 
I just want to make sure that um, I'm pricing it correctly. Does anybody got any tips on that? Victor put his hand up so fast. Yeah, I like I like talking about pricing. Um, so hey, Ryan, uh, what part of San Diego? I mean, California, are you from? I'm in the Bay Area, San Francisco. Oh, okay, I love the Bay Area. Go Warriors! I lived yeah, up yeah. there for 18 years. I live in San Diego now, but um, are you wholesaler or retailer? Um, resell. Um, I I want I kind of want to get into the wholesale itself, but I just don't know like what's the best way, you know, because I, I, I want to be competitive, but I, I just don't, I, but I don't want to give them away, you know? So, so when you say you're a retailer, that's what you said, right? Retailer. So you have your brand and you're selling your brand of merchandise online. Yes and no. Um, I, I guess because there's a lot of different ways to price things. Right. So it depends what the channel is, right? Right. So um, that's a good question. Um, right now, I'm just selling transfers to people, but um, if it comes to that point, then yeah, I, I you know, I, I don't, I, I'm not quite sure. So I don't personally deal in selling transfers. However, I did buy transfers from uh, Michael. And, uh, you know, if he's going to do enough volume, what you should do is you should come up with a price per square foot, right? So if your sheet is, my recommendation is if your sheet is, and I don't know what the DTF sheet is, but let's just say hypothetically, it's 24, uh, it's 18 inches wide, right? Let's just guess it's 18 inches wide. Let's make it 10, just so I could do the math easy in my <laughs> head. It's 10 inches wide and it's 20 inches long, right? That's 200 square inches of paper that you can have art on. What is your cost to print 200 square inches? Just fill it up with ink. And if you find out what your costs are, and then uh, what your time is, then you know that if you could tell your customer, hey, I will print any sheets for you. This is my size. It's 200, it's 20 by 10. And you can put whatever you want on it. So now you're not quoting this design or that design or that design. What you could do, what you want to do is you want to simplify it for yourself. So whether they want one design to fit the whole thing or they want, or they want a bunch of little left chest designs, and they just put them in there as close as they can, and they cut in between. Your price is always the same, so you don't have to go back to the drawing board and look at him. What's your art or whatever this is that? You can just tell them, boom. My, my I know my cost is four dollars in terms of hardware paper, and it's and let's say I want to add, let's say I want to make, you know, whatever per hour doing it. Those are your costs. And then you sell it for a profit. And so that's how I would recommend you do the sheets. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll look into that as far as um, costs and stuff. Thank you. Yeah. No worry. Do you know what your costs are? I know my, my cost of ink uh, as far as um, ink, paper, paper time. Um, paper, no. I haven't, I haven't um, broken that down into uh, the square footage. Okay, so always remember that when you on those DTF machines, when you do do a job, whether it's one sheet or if it's 50 sheets, and I'm still talking to the 10 by 20s, you always have that extra runoff sheet at the end. That is cost. So make sure you include that. Oh, yeah, good point. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Victor's absolutely right. We sell a ton of DTF. We plugged our machine in. We were the third people to get it and we haven't stopped. Um, and Victor's absolutely right. You need to decide how big you wanna sell, like we do by the meter, which is 40 inches, because we have people that they don't want small sheets, they want big sheets. So we sat down and we figured it out and that's how we sell our sheets. If they don't fill it up, that's on them. I'm selling you a gang sheet. You can sell it big or smaller if you want, but this is what we're selling and this is how much, and you can fill it up or you can waste the space. It's up to you. Okay, and that's the other thing. Like I I've seen a lot of people selling multiple sizes 24 48 yeah. i mean I, I really don't want to get into that it, yeah that, that's a good idea just keep it simple I, and just 
so that they want. I, I would disagree. I would disagree with you uh, uh, politely there, but why would you not want to sell 20 inch sheet or a 40 inch sheet or a 60 inch sheet? It doesn't matter to you. Like at the end of the day, you just have your template, fill out this template and, and the machine doesn't care. You just upload it and hit print and it counts the 30 inches by itself or the 40 inches by itself. So um, if you feel like you're gonna have the volume to do this and you have like a Shopify store or the Omni store, which I, I don't know if it does it or not, but they can actually make their gang sheets and produce it. And then that's that gets sent to you and they pay for it and they can say, oh, I want 15 of these. So at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Like if it's 30, 40, 60 inches, you're just uploading that file, hitting quantity six and sending them something that they've already paid for. Keep it simple, really simple. Yeah, okay. And, and I think for the most part, I'm, I'm overthinking it. <laughs> but um, we often do. <laughs> we often do, right? And I, I didn't want to get into the debacle of one color print, two color print, going back to the screen printing thing. You know, I just want to keep this side the digital stuff simple as it gets yeah so i appreciate you guys thank you no worries reach out if any time if you have any questions and i see in the chat ron adds uh mm -hmm. oh he's answering uh gabe who's asking why does the print head get clogged ron's answer is it depends uh humidity is a big factor i find that it if i stay in the 45 percent range i do not get clogs That'll also be determined by things like shaking your white bottles or, or um, purging out the separated white ink. Um, you know, using the machine at least once every three weeks, doing your maintenance properly, wet capping it properly. Uh, there's a, a pretty wide swath of factors. Not getting head strikes is a really important one too. Um, and all of these things can determine whether or not, or how frequently your print head gets clogs. Um, and I think, uh, something important is how you address it when a clog happens. Ron, go ahead. You know, one of the, uh, one of the big things I think a lot of people forget is, uh, you got to be diligent with these machines. And if you, you got to get in the habit of before you print do a nozzle check and mm -hmm. when you finish at the end of the day do a nozzle check because if you put that thing to bed like as i call it put it to bed every night and you don't do a nozzle check and you got a clock now this thing sits and it can further complicate things so just diligence on your maintenance every single day it doesn't take long it's 10 minutes at the most uh, when you go to shut them down at night and wet capping if mm. you don't wet cap <laughs> i don't know what to tell you you know you're you're breaking the process and you are going to have problems you've got to follow the process um mm -hmm. but um one th big things i noticed like say humidity if my humidity gets below 40 uh then you can expect some crazy stuff to happen but keeping that up and keeping your maintenance up is is huge yeah, yeah, humidity, I think a lot of people, uh, and a while back myself was included in this, uh, I was underestimating the impact of humidity on the printer. You know, it's like, okay, well, it's, it's the air and the ink is on the inside. How much can it really affect the ink flow? And it's fairly substantial. It's, it's more than uh, I think most people realize. So I, I think that's a really great addition that you brought into the, into the mix there, Ron. So thank you for that. Um, let's see, did I see another hand go up and then go back down? And cleaning the ink bottles. So, so to tease next week, um, we are gonna be talking about a couple of the maintenance items that we didn't really get too much into last week. Uh, cleaning the bottles is one of them. Uh, you know, the procedure for that is uh, not super straightforward. So we're going to spend some time going over the process for that and what to what to do, what not to do. And then also um, cleaning out the spit tray. Uh, I, I get, you know, more than a couple of questions on how to tackle that. So I reckon we'll do a video on it and then 
anytime someone has a question on it, I can just send them the video. Um, but I mean, we're pretty much at time. Were there any other questions that anybody had before we close it out? Sounds like we're good. All right, you guys, thank you so much for joining us on today's Creators Live. If there is anything else you need in the meantime, my email is in the chat, brian at omniprintonline.com. Feel free to reach out, always happy to help. And we'll see you next Wednesday, 2 p.m. Pacific. Woo! Woo!